Here, let's go ahead and go again. Um, I just, I, we're, we're recording again, guys. Um, you know, bottom line, we were just kind of envisioning this stuff with you. Really an interesting and shocking kind of testimony. Uh, very appreciative of what you've done. Uh, and I, what I know personally, um, as somebody who's been a member and a participant in quantum access projects, is that agencies like NSA and others through the use of the technology, have identified threats that we try to plan for based on the foreknowledge of them. This is contingency planning for future events. And one of these is a very pivotal issue for the future is this race card. Okay. And we talked about that before. And I definitely feel that incorporated into your life path. Um, I think that's really neat. And so you were just stopping about the State Department and how they were coming to get you out. Your mother had called and so on, kind of as an ordinary citizen, and put you in touch with them within 12 hours. So if you want to pick yeah, up from there. Um, we, were, we were instructed not to tell anybody the date that I was leaving. We were instructed not to tell anybody anything about the flights. Like I said, I knew that if I knew that if I had if they had routed me and, and at least 90% of all the flights to Cameroon go through Charles de Gaulle Airport. It's just the way it is. And so did you have the foreknowledge of that would be a dangerous place for you based on what you had seen in Africa? Or did yes. they debrief you to that yeah. fact? Okay. I knew that. I was curious about that. I knew that. And from an intuitive standpoint, I knew my inner knowing that if I had gone through Paris, I would be dead. Okay. I, I, would, be, I would disappear. And I would disappear. So when I got my tickets and I saw that they routed me through Brussels, I knew that they knew exactly what they were doing. Had there ever been a specific agency that you knew that you were targeted by as a result of your dealings with your ex-husband? No. What I did, though, um, I, was, I, sus I was suspect that um, once I got home that I'd be watched. I, I, knew, I knew that I would be watched because he's still there and um, he'll never give up. And he's known since he was 10 years old that he would be the next president of Cameroon. And God bless him, he's never given up, and he will never give up. Um, I, I knew when I came back from Africa, this is the truth, when I came back from Africa, I knew, and I said to God, there's nothing that I can do until their consciousness shifts. There would be nothing that I could do to be of benefit to the people until their consciousness shifts. I'll tell you something about Tony Blair. You mentioned being from Africa or from England when you were a kid at 16. Real quick, why were you there why, in England, just so people can my know? Parents, uh, my parents, my mother's British, and so we went back to, well, the story I was given <laughs> was that we went back to um, be a help to my grandparents because they were getting older, mm -hmm. and um, my parents had every intention of li you know, living there and making a life there. Why we went back. Okay, fair enough. Um, what I was going to ask you was about um, something to do with the British. I don't know why I Tony forgot. Blair. Oh, Tony, Tony Blair. Blair. Yeah, of course. This is another quantum access related incident in the, uh, the Ebola. I'll tell you right now, it's an inside joke. There will not be a rebola. Uh, as an inside joke, this this girl that worked with me on this stuff told me. I think it's funny to this day, but the Ebola outbreak has had a lot of conjecture over it. But it was it was in Dallas, Texas. That's really where I'm from. I was there when it happened, and I I was talking to my buddies. I was talking to this girl that I know for a long time. Her dad is very highly cleared in the Air Force. All I can really say about it, and uh, she grew up with this stuff. She has been through the sexual abuse. She uh, her dad taught her about the Illuminati and shit. I mean, it's just the we're all excuse the language, but. It's raw. It's just raw how this stuff goes down in the families when you're involved in it. It's just the way that it is. And uh, I told her, I said, this thing is finished. She was scared to death of this Ebola. And I said, look, it's already over. It's done. And what they had done was that they had the foreknowledge of this event. I don't know how long, but I know that I helped work the thing. And they sterilized the whole city with a type of technology that I'm on record stating Um over two years prior in radio interviews that you could forcibly inoculate and or basically sanitize 
uh, a region within a couple of hundred mile radius with wow. weather manipulation technology in conjunction with the optimization technique, which is well documented. And that's a fascinating thing. And so I saw Tony Blair go down and sell vaccines to Nigeria after the fact that Obama is on public television with the girl that had the Ebola. It says, the, the headline from ABC says, Obama eases Ebola fears with hugs and kisses. Okay? Yeah, this right. chick had Ebola. She's hugging and kissing on TV. We've got the cure, guys. Okay? It's fine. Yeah. We're never going to have Ebola again. That's exactly what they said. Yeah. Tony Blair is down there selling these things to these people. This is the type of agenda and thinking. And the disconnect in the media and how they choose to exploit it. There is no refuting what I just told you at all. It is a it is fact. And so it's, it, you can see that. And then what does that show us about the disconnect with the people you can't change. They can't. You can't do anything for them until their consciousness changes. God, how do we facilitate that? Though it's like you know, I ask my question. I've asked myself that question time and time and time and time again. What does that mean to me? Yeah. It was a really sad day when I finally had that realization that until they shift their consciousness, I could try and try and try my best. I could bring in technology, but the consciousness is such that it would have no impact whatsoever. So it's like, okay, what what does that bring? That I always bring everything back to me. What does that mean to me? And what that means to me is I'm part of the collective. We're all collected. Energetically, we're all collected. And so when I am able to go through my life journey and shift my vibration, that means there's that much more available to the rest of the collective to do that as well. That's how I see it. I have to bring it back to me. And, and what can I do? What choices can I make in my life that affect me? Knowing full well that I don't stop here. Mm -hmm. Sure. And so we're all, we're all connected. So as a kid, you took it back to when I think you said you were around four years old. Um, from that, you know, do you feel that there was some type of specific targeting in your case to induce alters or any of these other things yes. that we hear in other people's testimony. Yes. What is that like for you? And how has it played a role in your life? What have you identified? How have you grown and expanded upon that? That's a, you know, it's a, it's a hard topic for a lot of people. It, I felt that these were all very kind of very disparate ideas that had no connection. And I, um, I've identified one of the alters. And the reason that I use that word alter is... Um, as I say, I'm very guided, and I'm, I, um, I kept seeing MK Ultra, MK Ultra, MK Ultra, MK Ultra, MK Ultra, and I God, I'd see it everywhere. I'd see it on every single thing I'd look on, at on Facebook. I'd look at the YouTube, and there'd be 15 different uh, videos being suggested about MK Ultra, MK Ultra, MK Ultra, MK. It was everywhere, and I wanted to ignore it because I'd look at that, and it would resonate. And I, no, I don't, I don't want to know that. I don't, I don't want to know that. I don't, I don't want to know that. And so I ignored it for about, 50, for about a year. And it didn't stop. I kept seeing it. So what the connection is specifically to me, I don't know. I've read some of Fritz Springmeyer's material. I've read Kathy O'Brien, Kathy O'Brien's book. Mm -hmm. I have identified that Charles Taz Russell, who was the founder of Jehovah's Witnesses, was one of the 13 Illuminati families that came out in Fritz Springmeier's book. My parents were... Yeah, I did not realize that until you told me that today. I trust Fritz's research on the whole, definitely. Uh -huh. so, so I know that there was... Again, I go back to where, where in, in the more modern time, in, in the last year and a half or so, when Prince passed, that's when the floodgates opened up for me. And it was all around the fact that he was a Jehovah's Witness when he died. Did you see Prince in that video that I showed you earlier? In that, where the mattresses were, yes. where the gate was, yes. Prince was one of those yes. figures. There's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, that whole slave thing, he was, he was mind controlled. I am absolutely certain of it. No, they definitely, the use of song and, 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 and music for programming is a, a real thing. We know this. Um, there are some quirks to it that are very interesting because some of these songs will literally have a, be written decades before a scenario occurs. I mean, I have seen this innumerable times. And this is this 
same concept that was incorporated to like the Voyager missions, but on a quantum access related um, tip. And that's very important for people to start grasping this because that act of acknowledgement, the common element that we're fighting here is this artificial matrix system from my perspective. That is the veil to me. The veil is this hijacking of the of the quantum functions of the human organism in order to have an expressive manifestive result in the environment and so to me it sounds like you're experiencing this to some degree with your always saying mk ultra mk ultra are you somehow manifesting that what does it mean is this how do these triggers in our brain affect the manifestive outcome that we have in our environment is it there for that reason perhaps i i I know that my process has always been that when I have to pay attention and I see something and I resonate with it, that there's a piece, there's something I have to acknowledge or open up to or explore or experience in some manner or fashion. It's just been my process. That's how my life has always worked. So when I read Kathy O'Brien's story and I can feel in my body that there is a resonance in some of the things that she described, I have to pay attention. Does, what does that mean for me? I don't have those answers yet. I don't know. My father was German. My mother was British. Um, I suspect... Um, there was a, a great um, sci-fi show. It was called uh, Babylon 5. And within the storyline, there was this triluminary... And one of the people there, through their who they were as, a, as a, a person, their DNA would light up if they were of the right bloodline. Their DNA would light up this triluminary. And I can remember seeing that and thinking, I know that. If that were me, I could go there and I could, I could light that thing up because I have the right. So, again, it's all been through my own personal experience as my life has gone on and, I, and how it relates back to me. So I suspect that there's something about my bloodline, something very specific about my bloodline, and that's the, the thing that ties all of it together. I would that's agree. That's my suspicion. I'm sitting here looking at you, trying to classify your species, and looking at your ears. I've met real bona fide extraterrestrials. I know that I have some of it in my own blood. I, most of my crew has, I mean, and most of the I mean, we all have it to varying degrees, some very specifically. And I think that you may have some Nordic characteristics. I mean, it's hard for me to classify that. I wish I was better at that. But I would agree with the fact that it is, ultimately it boils down to us frequency in exactly. your DNA. Exactly. Um, and that's really what allows us to manifest. And, you know, is that, what does that mean? Does that mean that, what about the rest of the bloodlines and how they play out? Are you here for a special reason from your perspective? Or well, is everybody I, special? What does that look like? What I can tell you is that... Um, I've, I've also had... Ma okay, so okay, we'll go into this now. Um, the being that I am was not the being that was born into this body. The being that was born into this body walked out, and I walked in. I came from another dimensional reality. That's what I know. The memories, most all the memories from my childhood went with the being that left, the, the Anita that was born into this body, and I walked in in 1989, December the 30th, 1989, actually. What was that date? It's a date that I, my vein, that I had surgery, because I was shown, I was shown specifically the, where, where I walked in. And so I know I have a very, I have, a, I have several missions, one in particular that has to do with helping to establish an alternative financial and economic backbone on this planet. I'm not quite sure what that means. I know what the words mean. But as that relates to me today, I'm not certain. But I know that I came in for a purpose. And I came in because of who I am spiritually to hold the frequency that I am. So it's not surprising to me that I mean, there's technologies that can tell when, when people...
people, certain souls are coming in or certain spirits. Certainly are there in, is. And they know exactly who they are. They'll recognize your soul. They'll know exactly who you are. Yeah. So I'm, I'm certain they know because... They, yeah, that's probably what, one of the reasons that you're doing here. This is certainly something that I don't talk about with many people, that I only talk about with people in my very close circle, and that is a very well-known aspect of, of technology, projects. Uh, they can't identify your soul. They can know who you were in your past life for a yeah. fact. Yeah. They'll put you together. Uh, you'll remember things. Uh, and it's really a pretty humbling experience, I think, for some of us, particularly after the stuff we've been through in this life, looking back like, man, I was this, I was that. And certainly I was in these, so I did these things. Yeah. And the interconnectedness of people is something that I still see in that for myself. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it really opens up an interesting can of worms there for, for I think, anybody who considers those subjects in their own life or anybody else's context. It's a pretty fascinating subject, but... Well, Earth needs help. Yeah, and that mirrors my own life path, what you said just now is why I said that, because this technology for my dad is about this, you know, you can't break the backbone economically with just, you can't, just, you can in different areas, like Africa would be a great place to say, here's the free energy, man. You know, but we can't use it in America right now because it's going to break our fucking backs. You know, we're not going to have the, we can't, we have to wean ourselves, we have to build a bridge in the future to get ourselves off fossil fuel. And it sucks, but we have to do it in a way in which the people who have previously been profiting for this for their own vicious and wicked ends that have continued to profit off their hoarding of technology simultaneously to them uh, have to be held accountable and we have to stop this thing. And so, it sounds like a similar focus, if nothing less. Well, uh, yeah, and I, this technology that I'm talking about in my family bloodline is actually viable for that. And so it's interesting. The people that you come around. I don't the, know. Um, <laughs> it wasn't until I began to understand Bitcoin that the words, because it always comes out exactly the same, to help to establish an alternative financial and economic backbone on this planet. And until I began to see what cryptocurrency was all about, it began to make some sense to me what this mission could possibly be about. Sure. And there's other elements to that, but that's always the piece that comes out, and it's the same every single time. <laughs> you blew everybody in this room away. From I mean, you certainly blew me away. Um, you know, this is not the last time we're going to talk to you. Um, I, we've almost got you for an hour. There's about... If you want to fill up a whole hour, you've got about 12 and a half minutes to do that. It's in two parts. That's digestible for people, I think. Mm -hmm. So what else do we need to know? What else do you feel like is, is important? Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Or is there a time where I should have just basically kept my mouth shut? What, what do you no, got? I, I appreciate being able to speak. Um, what's fast again, this is really fascinating for me, but as I... I we all went back and had dinner, and I went back to the room, and I prayed. And as I was walking down here, my prayer was, please let me speak whatever, that's God's honest truth, let me speak what needs to be spoken. Whatever words, let me be a clear channel so that information that needs to come through. I have no idea you're going to do this. We're resonating on that, too, because that was pretty much my prayer this morning in the shower. I usually pray. And I, I've had a lot of blockage there for me because I've gotten bitter. My, my fucking skin is not like I'm not a, a woolly mammoth. I have been through some pretty rough shit. Mm -hmm. You know, all of us have. And so it's, it's good for me to acknowledge that, step out of that and say, hey, I needed this too. Uh, people need to hear this stuff. So I think it serves the, me today. The most important, there's, I, I, I think I've identified for me that this conference was not so much about Morgellons for me. The conference was about there were pieces of information that I needed to hear and there were pieces of information that I needed to give. I'm very clear about this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes where we get caught up is we start judging the individual, the human, that brings the information forth that we may need to hear. And so the most important place for me to stay in staying centered is to take the information that I need because I can feel it. I can it resonates. I can feel what it, oh I need that. That's that's extraneous. I don't need to know that. That piece, yeah, I needed that piece. So we don't get caught up in the personalities or we don't get caught up in throwing information out because we have this judgment about some person who might bring some information through. 
And that to me is really, really important. And it always, 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 always comes back to here. It always comes back to our hearts. When we can live and stay in our heart center and we can ask for guidance, that's the pure channel that we have to our higher self and to all of the divine beings, the light beings that are working with us, our angels, our guides, whatever term you want to use, that's our direct channel. And so although we see all of this going around, we, we have an understanding of the broader nature of reality, it always comes back to me. It comes back to how am I living and how am I making choices from my heart. And that, to me, is the most important thing that I could convey in all of, all of my story is to come back to, always come back to our heart chakra, always come back to that place of honest truth, because that's where the truth is. The truth is not here, it's here. Mm. And when we do that, each one of us is guided. Each one of us has our angels and guides and teachers, and they're all there to help us. We just have to be aware of it and allow ourselves to get quiet and still enough to be able to go into that heart space and get the answers that we need you know what is the next step so I live my life this way so coming down here I had no idea that we were going to do this tonight what I did know is that there would be things that I would need to speak and so here we are awesome that is fantastic um, is there anything that you would like to add um, anything at all I mean what anything I just want to, I'm, I'm so grateful for every person that has touched my life. There have been a whole lot of them that weren't real pleasant experiences. But because I know that I can relate to something through my own experience, when other people have experiences, I can relate to them because I've had the experience. And I can say that, the, and I identified this a long time ago, there is nothing that a woman anywhere in the world could ever say to me that would scare or frighten me. Nothing. Not a damn thing. Nothing. Because I've been through it. That's like such a powerful thing. I mean, the fear is what feeds that system. That's what gives it the power right there every time. Yeah. Yeah. So there's nothing that um, anyone could ever say to me that would frighten me. Never. Because I... I I live by that connection. I'm looking around me at this conference, and there's just so many examples of a strong testimony in a woman. And I'm fat, I'll try to tell you, my own mom. My mom is like the most. She's the strongest woman. She she could. She's done so much already. You just you can't we can't phase her. She does not suffer full. She's the best person. She'd do anything for you. And I've seen that in women my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's why I'm the only guy here. I have no idea <laughs> about that, but. It's so amazing to just look around and see you guys and just be like, man, it's humbling to think how tough you guys are for me. We've um, all been brought together. There's a higher purpose. We, as a collective, because I'm a systems person. I mean, I, I realize mm, it's what mm. I bring in. I, I'm a systems person. I see systems. Sure. And so when we know that we have a certain power uh, with our intention as an individual... When we start beginning to look at the collective and we begin to look at small groups and as small groups, when we start connecting and we set our intention, that is really powerful. I mean, Jesus said, where there are two or more gathered in my name, <laughs> Just there I shall also be. That principle, same. And so when we have these, these groups, when we have these conferences and we're coming together in unity a purpose, and we're coming together with a focus and intention for the betterment of all of our brothers and sisters. That's really powerful. And that, so, we work with groups as well. Any comments as far as the AI for you? What is that? Oh, God. That's a whole nother um, issue I'm kind of wrestling with that when some choices and decisions in a, a business venture that I'm involved in, I'm very concerned about um, the use of, of an artificial intelligence. It's a broad, it is a broad spectrum of, and of many different facets to it. Um, I know that I'm meant to be responsible and, of course, would never be involved in anything that would not 
or that would would be of harm or could possibly be of harm to anyone. Um, the whole subject of AI is just scary as hell to me. I don't understand it. I don't. It's you hard said to, nobody could ever say anything to scare you, but you're scared of the AI. Um, no, what I said was there's nothing <laughs> that a woman could say to me that she had experienced that would frighten uh, okay. or scare me. Okay, gotcha. No, there's definitely things that frighten me. Okay. And that's a subject. And the reason it frightens me is I don't know enough about it. I'm, I don't know enough about the mechanics of it. I don't know enough about its influence over me. Um... And what of demons? What of etheric beings oh, well. the, on the bad side of the, you know, you, I hear you talking about your guides and all this. What's the flip side of that coin? How does it play out? Do they use technology? You've got a few minutes there on that. I believe so. I mean, I've had numerous demons cast out throughout my life. There have been different um, situations that I've been in where I've, I've identified that and sought help and a couple of other instances where... Um, other people have been able to uh, help me with that. I believe that's all part of this, the ritual abuse because I believe that part of the control mechanism is that they're actually able to implant demons into the children. I've so seen it. That, so that I've heard that control. testimony I don't know how many times. They will specifically, they will summon and specifically attach a demon. Yeah. We were just talking about this on the parking lot. You were in here, you didn't hear us. I know. But yeah, that's a common account. That we hear re repeatedly, certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I know that happened to me. And, um, yeah, so I get bits and pieces as I go along. Sure. Wow. Yeah. So do you, do you feel like that you've been splintered? Do you feel like you have, like, a... Yes. Yeah? How did that, how do you trigger into that? What taps you into that, and what do you do? Um... I've no there I've only identified one other altar and um, she has a particular style that is different than mine <laughs> and um, she has a different way of expressing herself and the way that she perceives the world is very different mm. from me mm. but she comes out sometimes and um, do you feel that it's a intentional stimulus that's given to you by somebody directly for a desired result on their own behalf or bidding? Or do you feel like it's an existential thing that just triggers you and it's uh, arbitrary? I, because of the nature of the way she perceives the world and the nature of her expression in the world, she was definitely created for a very specific purpose. The altar. Okay. And it's sexual in nature. Hmm, what does that mean? Elaborate on that aspect. When that particular part of me, when that altar, she has a name, I won't go into that, but she has a name, and I can identify her. Her expression in the world is coming from a very sexual perspective. So the way that she moves, the way that she speaks, the way that she interacts with people um, is very highly sexually charged. So I know that she was created for a special purpose. What does that bring about in terms of manifestive quality in your environment? Your ability to create? How does sexual function and energy play out a role for that for you as a female and with your partners and stuff? In a brief nutshell, you've got a little bit of time there. Um, well, our sexual energy is our creative energy. And my life, um, all my life I've been involved in... I was a financial planner. I had my Series 7, which is my stockbroker's license. I had my Series 3, which was my commodities license. I owned a commodities trading firm. I owned, I was a financial planner, so I owned my own business there. I owned a coffee house and roastery. I can do business with my hands tied behind my back, standing on my head. I understand business. It's linear. It's logical. It's numbers. I get that. So where I've been following my path in my life is to go into my creativity. So I bought a beautiful camera. I'm studying photography. I'm now also looking to incorporate art into my life. So my creativity, although it had been really only focused in writing, is now focused directly in visual image and mood and content in fine art photography. That's the direction that I'm going in. So, um, Wow, neat. 
Any military or intelligence um, ties to you through your family or otherwise? I'm not aware of any. My dad was in the army in England uh, in the 50s. Met my mom in Got England. About nine seconds before it cuts off. And, um, Thank you so much. Awesome information. Looking forward to doing this again um, soon. Okay. Yeah, absolutely.